All right. My name is Rick. I'm an alcoholic. I want to work. Welcome, everyone, to the third annual Fellowship of the Spirit in New York. Um, and from... And I'll introduce the speaker, which is Mark H. from Dallas, Texas, and Dave F. from Green Village, New Jersey. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Dave. And uh, I don't know if you guys are like me, but I think, I suspect you are. Um, uh, a little bit of tension from the, uh, the New York Friday evening shore traffic to get here. Um, so before we get going, um, one of the concepts that I always like to talk about, that any time that I get together with another person to talk about the 12 steps and the program and what this, this spiritual path that we're on, and that's what this whole weekend is about, it's the fellowship of the spirit. And um, we're talking about the second fellowship in AA. You know, there's, there's two fellowships in AA, and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with the people that are in this room. The people that would come to this kind of fellowship understand that there's two fellowships. You know, there's the spirit of the fellowship, which is just the friendship and the camaraderie. And then there's the fellowship of the spirit, that people that go through the 12 steps and actually work the 12 steps, their spirit wakes up, and we connect with each other at a special level. And it's a, it's a bond that we have that... that that we share, and um, so I always like to sit down when, it, when it, even with a newcomer, I sit down. And I talk about uh, us being a spiritual body. Anytime the two of us get together, because for me, you people are, are a mirror, and I look at you and I look at your eyes and I see the love come back at me, and it gets me an opportunity to see what's inside myself by looking at you. And I, hopefully, that this weekend will be the exact same. So I know my mirror right now is pretty tarnished. So I'm sure there's some people out there that have. You know, the guy that just cut you off back on, on the LIE or the Grand Central. Why don't we get quiet for a minute and we'll just, have, we'll just sit here and, and, uh, <clears throat> and then I'll, uh, after a minute or two, I'll go ahead and, and open up the meeting with a, with a prayer and then we'll jump into this and, uh, and uh, have a good time with this. Father, I ask that you come in, into this room and be with a spiritual body, Father, that we, we realize that this is a gift of your grace and your love to us, that no other time will this group of people, these spirits, be here together, and that we may have an interaction that is truly joyous in sharing your love. And Father, I ask that you help us set aside everything that we think we know about what this weekend is going to entail and uh, remove our fears of what may block us off from hearing the truth. Help us to set aside our egos and our, our preconceived notions of what, what the 12 steps are about, that you may enter our hearts and our minds to have a new experience with each other. And Father, help us to set aside the angers and the, the emotions of the day. Help us to be peaceful and calm as we enjoy this. Allow us to laugh and enjoy each other's presence and share in the, in the harmony that a group of, of drunks can present to each other. And lastly, Father, I'd like to ask a special prayer that after we leave here this evening, that you keep us safe and protected as we go through this spiritual event with each other uh, through these next three days, and that we can keep in touch with each other as a spiritual entity between the, the breaks that we take, that we keep mindful of where we need to be when we're in this group talking about the importance of these steps, because it, it really is life and death, Father. And thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share with these people. I'm forever in your debt. Amen. So what are we doing here? Um, for me, uh, I got uh, uh, asked to come, come here and present. And um, you know, the first thing that my ego does is says, oh, yeah, sure, 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 I'd be happy to. And then a week later or so, you start thinking about the magnitude of, what did I just accept? You know, um, 
getting up in front of a, a bunch of, of, of drunks and, and uh, you might as well just paint a big bullseye. I've already gotten about several comments on my shirt. The reason I wore this shirt and, and is because, you know, if you're going to be, be up here like a bullseye, you might as well wear one, you know. And um, our egoic minds are going to want to not listen to what's transpired here. What I share here this weekend, I hope, will be my experience with these 12 steps. Um, and uh, I know that Mark's going to be sharing the same thing. It's going to be his experience. You can't have our experience. It's our experience. But one of the things that we're going to have here this weekend is together we're going to share a new experience. And even somebody that picks up these tapes and listens to them down the road, they're not going to have our experience. They're not going to feel the cold of the air conditioning blow across and that, that static, that, that, that spiritual static that's going to exist amongst us, I hope and I pray as we go through this weekend. So uh, I really hope that you open up your minds and, and don't listen to the messenger. There's times that I will be arrogant and pompous. Please forget that. <laughs> listen for the message. It's real important that you listen for the message and compare what I'm sharing with you. Is that your truth? Have you had a similar experience? Because that's the only way to get in and see what our ego does not want to see. You know, and I will try to be as honest as I can be up here and share with you wherever the Spirit directs us. I mean, we have no outline. We, didn't, we purposely did not do that. Our goals for this weekend are to basically bring us into the Spirit. So we're going to try to bring each of the 12 steps back to basically 10 and 11 to connect everything to the Spirit so that we because I doubt, is there any newcomers here like within the first month of their sobriety? You got one in the back. Great. Uh, excellent. Glad to have you. What you're going to hear here is people that have worked the 12 steps with a sponsor out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So make sure that you sit down with somebody and go through the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous with somebody one-on-one. -on -one, because some of the concepts we're sharing here are going to scare the hell out of you. And you're going to say, these guys are full of it. <laughs> but it's our experience. Um, and one of the things I personally like to do is go back in history and take a look at how did Bill and Bob get sober? What were they looking at? What were they reading? What were they thinking? What was going on in those days? And uh, being that Mark is from Texas, one of the things I got for him to start out with is uh, a Texas preamble that, that the first time I was ever in Texas, uh, they read this preamble at a meeting. It's not conference approved preamble anymore, but this is what they were using when, when Ebby and the boys went down to Texas and got the message going down there. So I'm going to have Mark read that preamble, and then I'm going to read a preamble that's even more radical that comes from uh, Florida archives um, and uh, you'll kind of get the point of where we're going from here with this workshop. Good evening family. My name is Mark Houston. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, power of God separated me from alcohol on October the 19th of 1982. You got to love a speaker that starts out making amends to you for his arrogance. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, and, and I want you to know AA's taught me to be respectful. See, he's been sober a lot longer than me, which is why he's going first. I want you all to understand that, right? So this is the uh, Texas preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. We're gathered here because we're faced with the fact that we're powerless over alcohol and we're unable to do anything about it without help of a power greater than ourselves. We feel each person's religious convictions, if any, are their own affair, and the simple purpose of the program of AA is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves, regardless of what our individual conceptions of that power may be. In order to form a habit of depending upon and referring all we do to that power, we must first apply ourselves with some diligence. But repetition confirms and strengthens this habit, then faith comes naturally. We've all come to know that as alcoholics, we're suffering from a serious disease for which medicine has no cure. Our condition may be the result of an allergic reaction to alcohol, which makes it impossible for us to drink in moderation. This condition has never, by any treatment with which we are familiar, been permanently cured. The only relief we have to offer is absolute abstinence, a second meaning of AA. There are no dues or fees. The only requirement is an honest desire to stop drinking. Each member seeks to square his debt by helping others to recover. An AA member is a person with an acknowledged alcoholic problem who has found the key to abstinence from day to day 
by adhering to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. The moment he resumes drinking, he loses all status as a member of AA. <laughs> his reinstatement is automatic, however, when he again fulfills his sole requirement for membership, an honest desire to quit drinking. You ever notice you only have that desire when you're drinking? <clears throat> not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are seeking only temporary sobriety. We have a way out in which we can absolutely agree and in which we join in harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are those who will not or cannot lend themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are incapable of being honest with themselves. You may like this program or you may not, but the fact remains it works and we believe it's our only chance to recover. There's a vast amount of fun included in the AA Fellowship. Some people may be shocked at our apparent worldliness and levity, but just underneath there is a deadly earnestness and a full realization we must put first things first. With each of us, the first thing is our alcoholic problem, and faith must work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. Kind of a little different preamble than you're used to hearing. If you think that one's a little bit different, pay attention to this one because it, it's a lot different. And you can see why they've toned it down from what we're exposed to in AA today. But this is the kind of feeling that the people had when Bill and Bob got sober. They were passionate about it because they escaped the gates of death. And you will find out from hearing me this weekend, I'm a very passionate alcoholic. I believe in this stuff. Most people look at me like I'm a Looney Tune because I, I'm a mad dog drinker. I drank like a mad dog you know, when I drank, I drank for proof. That's all I cared about. I didn't care. I wouldn't waste my time with beer unless it's all I could get. You know, I would go into a liquor store and say, what's the proof on the bottle? And that's how I drank. I was looking to get as far away from me as I could possibly get. And I drank that way. And I need to get sober that way. I need to work the steps that way. I work this program hard. And uh, it, it's, it's part of the passion that makes me me. And uh, um, this is a passionate uh, preamble from the early days. It comes from the Florida archives. We are gathered here because we are faced with the fact that we are powerless over alcohol. Unable to do anything a- about it without help of a power greater than ourselves, we feel that each person's religious views, if any, are his own affair. The simple purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves, regardless of what our individual conception of that power may be. In order to form a habit of depending upon and referring all we do to that power, we must first apply ourselves with some diligence. By often repeating these acts, they become habitual, and the help rendered becomes natural to us. We have all come to know that as alcoholics we are suffering from an illness which medicine has no cure. Our condition may may be the result of an allergy which makes us different from other people. It has never been by any treatment with which we are familiar permanently cured. The only relief we have to offer is absolute abstinence, the second meaning of AA. There's the second time that's been mentioned in, in both preambles from early days. The, the second meaning of AA is, is absolute abstinence. Um, there are no dues or fees. The only requirement for membership is desire to stop drinking. Each member squares his debt by helping others to recover. An Alcoholics Anonymous is an alcoholic through application of an adherence to the AA program has forsworn the use of alcoholic beverages in any form. The moment he takes such as one drop of beer, wine, spirits, or any other alcoholic beverage, he has automatically lost his status as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are not sincere than desire to remain sober for all time. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and on which we can join in harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our program. Those who do not recover, people who uh, will not or simply cannot give themselves to the simple program. Uh, You may like the program or you may not, but the fact remains it works and is your only chance to recover. There is a vast amount of fun included in the AA Fellowship. Some might be shocked at our seemingly worldliness and levity, but just underneath there lies a deadly earnestness and full realization that we must... uh, put first things first in each of us and the first thing is our alcoholic problem to drink is to die faith must work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish 
In order to set the tone for this meeting, I ask you to bow your heads for a few moments of silent prayer and meditation. I wish to remind you that whatever is said at this meeting expresses our individual opinions of today and up to this moment. We do not speak for AA as a whole, and you are free to agree or disagree with anything which might not be reconciled with what is in the AA Big Book. If you don't have an AA book, it's time you bought one. Read it, study it, live it, loan it, scatter it, and then learn from what it means to be an AA. To me, that says it all, you know. This is a life and death program for me. I don't take this with too much levity. I mean, I laugh at myself, and we laugh at each other, but this is life and death for me. I'm not one of those AAs that just doesn't drink and go to meetings. Uh, like I said, I, I work the program hard. Um, everybody this weekend should have, should have gotten one of these handouts. looks like that. If you didn't, they're over at the table. Um, there's also going to be uh, some of the experience that, that I've recently shared uh, with Mark, we'll be talking about that later, is uh, a 17 area inventory. When we start talking about the four step, we're, we always, at least in my life, I always start with what's in the big book as in my minimum. I write a resentment inventory and then a fear inventory and then a harm stand to others with emphasis on sex, but then I'm quick to see religious people are right and I take it to the next level. And it's an inventory that the idea came from the grapevine and, uh, and we did it and, and you'll be hearing about that and I brought some copies of that for anybody that's interested and we'll be talking about steel on steel which if anybody's interested in that I got some handouts on that so there'll be a number of, of handouts this weekend um, the handouts are not con included as part of this workshop I pay for all that stuff out of my own pocket so I will be passing the, bu the bucket f for the seventh tradition if you feel like contributing that's fine if you don't I understand I took that risk when I when I bought all the, uh, the stuff um, the handouts, you notice there's little colons on the margins. I use the study edition of the big book. It makes it easier. One of the reasons I bother to put that anal retentive package together is, for you people is so that you don't have to sit down and scribble notes and get distracted. One of the things that I've been working with quite extensively recently is being present and in the now. And you'll hear us talking about that a lot this weekend. How do you be present in the now? And if I'm writing notes, I can't be listening. I can't be, I disconnect from the spirit and I run into my mind. And where does my alcoholic problem reside? In my mind. So anything that can get me out of my mind, because I am out of my mind, <laughs> you know, that's the purpose of the notes, is so that you can be present and awake and aware. If you feel, by all means, if you feel the need to write in notes, go ahead. Um, there's, in the study edition of the book, there's blank pages on each page, so you can write notes. It's got the one page of the big book and, and blank notes on the other side. Um, if you don't have a big book and you can't afford the six bucks to buy one of those, you want to borrow it, go right ahead. I just ask that you don't write in it. If you choose to highlight, I got a whole can of highlighters up here, which uh, I will be opening up for anybody that, that needs it. Matter of fact, I can pass it around if it. Um, it's funny. I'm, I'm started waiting for people to start making amends for the highlighters. This is my third can of highlighters that I've lost. At, at you know, they just start dwindling. You know, there's probably I don't know 100 highlighters in the can, and after the end of the last workshop, I think there was eight left. So, um, I'm, anybody that's got one of my highlighters from one of the other workshops, you know, I'll be around for amends later on. <laughs> um, if you can't, haven't figured it out, I'm going kind of slow in the beginning to, rather than just jumping right into the big book to give us a chance to, to settle in as a group, give the stragglers a chance to get here who are still stuck on the highway, who are losing their cool, going, man, it started a half hour ago, I want to be there, I want to be there. And uh, I always like to start out with some humor if I can, and I'm not a very, tremendously gifted in the, in the event of humor, but uh, one of my friends who's guilty of sitting in here in the front row sent this to me, I believe. Um, it says, you may have a drinking problem if, one, you lose arguments with inanimate objects. <laughs> Two, you hold on to the lawn and, and keep falling off of the earth. <laughs> Three, your job is interfering with your drinking. Can anybody relate to that? <laughs> Four, the doctor finds traces of blood in your alcohol stream. <laughs> Five, your career won't progress beyond senator from Massachusetts. <laughs> Six, the back of your head keeps getting hit by the toilet seat. Seven. You sincerely believe alcohol uh, to be the elusive fifth food group. Eight. This is one I love. 24 hours in a day, 24 beers in a case. Coincidence? <laughs> Nine. Two hands and just one mouth. Now that's a drinking problem. And ten. You can focus better with one eye closed. We got 37 of those, so I'll try to intersperse those as we go through, but I figured I'd start out with ten of those suckers. Um, there's a, uh, another friend of mine... Uh, Barefoot Bill sent this thing to me, and, and at first I kind of dismissed it. And then Mark and I were talking about how to start this workshop and get the concept of how do you have an open mind? 
you know. Um, there's the old adage, I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard it before, is, is how do you know what you don't know? And uh, if you sit down and think about it, it'll make you crazy. I've spent quite a bit of time on that this week, you know. I had somebody come up to me and ask me this week if, uh, if I did something and I'm, I don't remember it. And I'm thinking, how do I know if I did it or not? I don't remember, you know. And it's sort of like back to, it brought me right back to the blackout days. When you have that feeling like, if I did, I know I can clean up the mess because I'm sober today. I got 12 steps to do that with. But if I didn't, oh no, what if I what if I'm going to attempt to make amends for something I didn't do and how do I know and you get the hamster on the wheel and it just won't get off um, but one of the things of having an open mind for me is is, uh, is why am I here what's my purpose and uh, there's seven questions here and uh, something to think about it says who am I recovering for if it's your spouse the job the court a cause or a friend or associate I may be missing the mark and have to rethink or undo the whole thing Experience teaches me that sobriety only works or keeps going when I'm doing it for myself. What am I resisting? When you hear a question or hear a statement here that you immediately throw up and say, oh, he's full of it, or, you know, that, I don't believe that, that, you know, and you have an opinion on something, ask yourself, why am I resisting? Ask the question, is that my experience or is it not your experience? If it's your experience, then by all means, go with your experience. But if it's not your experience and it's just your opinion, then you have to ask yourself the question, why am I resisting? What am I afraid of? And delve into that. That will be a jewel. If you get one of those jewels this weekend, we will have done our job, is to get you to question one concept where your ego has you blocked off. Three, what is the lesson here? You know, uh, People call us teachers, but I believe we're all teachers. You know, I'm just here. I'm a drunk to share my experience, strength, and hope with you. Um, in doing that, I got a lot of experience with AA. Um, I got a lot of experience with the 12 steps. I also have a lot of experience on how not to work the 12 steps. And I'll be sharing some of that. So uh, we're all teachers, and I expect later on that I'm going to get taught something from you guys. We're, hopefully, I think we've got it planned on the docket to do Theater of the Lie, and uh, then we're all going to get an education when we start doing Theater of the Lie. Um, four, what am I doing that needs to be done? Am I doing what needs to be done here? Am I just socializing? Am I just hanging out to have a good weekend? Or is there a purpose here? Does God, did God bring you to this weekend to do something specific? I, I believe, and it's my experience, that there's no coincidences. Mark and I were just talking about that at dinner time. There are no coincidences. You know? So maybe God's got a purpose for you here. It may not just be to hear the two of us speak. You know? Keep an open mind. See if there's a purpose that you're supposed to be doing when you're here. Maybe somebody says something to you and they're really reaching out to you and they may need to talk. Maybe you need to miss a session, buy the tapes, and go in the other room and spend 10 minutes with somebody and talking to them about something. Because hopefully we're going to open up the box, that box that we all hide deep down in our soul. We're going to let a little bit of light shine in there, and it may be time for that beast to wake up. And you may need to get rid of something like right here, right now. And trust me, it wouldn't be the first time that I would have done inventory in the middle of a, of a, of a workshop. You know, as the presenter and as a participant. I've been affected at, at workshops where I need to write inventory. It may happen where you're going to end up having to fist step with somebody. You got something that's you didn't even realize. You remember something. Don't bury it down again. I, I beg you. If it comes out this weekend, pick it out. Take a look at it. Shun the sun, sun, uh, the, shine the sunlight of the spirit on it. You know, that may be the purpose for this weekend. Um, am I losing my energy to do this? If you've been sober for a little while, ask yourself, what's my energy level? Am I still enthusiastic as these two Looney Tunes up here? You know, do I still have the, the passion for the 12 steps and 12-stepping and carrying this message and doing this deal and going out and having a new experience and writing an inventory? Or am I just sitting here and I'm going to listen to it and just kind of go, that was really nice. I had a good time. Interesting ideas. And then walk out and go right back to the same old behaviors. You know, see what your energy level is. If you walk out of here pumped up and enthusiastic to go out and have a new experience with the 12 steps, then I've done my job. All right. Who am I giving my power to? If I say something up here that really tweaks you and twerks you, ask yourself why you've bothered to give me so much power. You know, because I sure as hell don't need it. I got all the power I need from up there. You know, I have a higher power. You know, and if you give me the power and let me into your head and rattle around in there, take a look at it. Don't waste the opportunity. It's a wonderful gift from God, you know. And ask yourself, lastly, who's in control? You know, we're just presenters up here. But who is the ultimately in control of how this weekend? If you had an expectation for how this weekend is going to come out and what's going to happen here, if you walk out that door on Sunday feeling disappointed, whose problem is it? You know, it's who's 
who's in control, who was in power here, and you missed the mark, you know? So keep an eye idea of that. Hopefully that just opens your ideas for some questions, because this is a personal workshop. We're all here for ourselves, and we're here to share as a, as a spiritual body. So become part of this deal. On the breaks, don't just go out and smoke your cigarette in the corner. Stick your hand out and say, hey, how are you doing? Read somebody's name tag. See where they're from. Get to know people. You know, and see what happens. Watch God work through this spiritual body. Because rarely will you find this many sober people who are actually doing the deal as when you get to one of these big book workshops. And it's a tremendous power source. If you don't get your batteries recharged from this, you've missed something. You know, at least that's my experience. You know, either that or you're not alcoholic. You know, I've, I've seen people that say, I don't get that. And I look at them and I kind of go, well, let's talk about this. Maybe you're not truly one of us. You know, so... Uh, my throat's getting tired, so I'm going to turn it back to Mark, and he's going to go for a little while, and, and, uh, and uh, I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Mark, alcoholic. <clears throat> uh, spiritual living for me is about having an open mind. Uh, die each night, be born again each day. Uh, I'll use some different words from what Dave said, but I would ask you, I'd like to teach you about the path of consideration. Um, the path of consideration is a tool that I use to bypass that part of you that thinks it knows everything, has an opinion about everything, is attached to an experience, a methodology, you name it. And what the path of consideration says is consider it. And what that allows is, is that part of us, that, that ego that is always defended. See, if you approach me or present me with something I have not done, what is our initial reaction to that? I must defend that which I have not done. I must defend what I am doing. Growth does not happen from that position. <laughs> so the, what the, when, when I work with the word consider is there, there's a part of me that if you'll say to me, would you consider what this mind says is the same as yours. It says, yeah, go ahead and listen to him. We'll disregard it anyhow. But it gets in there. See? So this weekend, work with the path of consideration. Uh, Dave and I have no answers for anybody in this room. Uh, we're here to share our experience with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the program. We're not here to talk to you about our program. Uh, I can talk to you about that. That's my program brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous. So did yours. <laughs> I'm here to share my experience with the program. I want to tell you a little story because it's a story to me. I'm not attached, by the way, to that which took me to God. And a little story to explain that. Uh, we're all at the base of a mountain, and the only way to get up the mountain is donkeys. So every one of us is given a donkey to ride up the mountain. Now, instead of enjoying the view as we go up the mountain, what we start doing is starting to say things like this, my donkey is better than your donkey. Okay, But the bottom line it is, when you get to the top, we all got to dismount the donkey and the view is the same. So get past your attachment to your donkey. You know, um, we're going to talk about AA's donkey. That's the big book. That's the 12 steps. I particularly use this story when I am dealing with people who are religious zealots who are attached to their donkey. You know, I got a Christian donkey, and I got a Buddhist donkey, and I got a Taoist donkey, and I got a Jewish donkey. And, you know, my experience with God is anything that speaks of separation is not of God. It is of man. So, but this weekend, we're here to share our experience with AA's donkey. That's the big book, right? But you need to understand, I'm not attached to that, right? One time or another, I have worshipped everything that points to God instead of God, including my own mind. Uh, I had two or three years of worshipping the, the, the big book, trying to fit it in places that, in the human body, in people who didn't want it. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, those of you who've had a revolutionary spiritual experience know what I'm talking about you 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 want to share it with everybody most who are not in the least bit interested about your spiritual experience uh, you you're absolutely convinced that AA in your area has gone down the toilet they don't know what they're doing they're killing people uh, you you wish AA had police squads to go in and really straighten these people out and uh, and you make sure you go around and slander probably about as many groups as you can uh, uh, in the middle of all that and when you wake up about three years down the road and nobody likes you and you have maybe one or two friends and, and you wake up to all that, <laughs> you, you get to go back and kind of clean some of that up and uh, those kinds of things. But uh, 
but I'm not, I'm not attached to the donkey. What I what I do want to share with you this weekend is my my experience with the steps. Uh, I want to tell you that I am a fundamental Orthodox member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, some of you, I think, have an idea what that means. Uh, it means if it's not in the book, it's not for me. Uh, I happen to work in the field of chemical dependency, and unlike perhaps a lot of you, I'm not shielded from alcoholics and, and drug addicts dying in my life. Uh, I see it all the time. Uh, this past year, uh, six people I have taken through the steps, people I was close to, uh, people I loved, you know, like, like a brother. Uh, two of them died, four of them uh, are still back out there again. These are men and women who sat in workshops like this. Uh, these are men and women who've done the work, who've done the steps. Uh, uh, a man named Big Frank made a statement one time, probably 6% of the people come to AA ever get sober, stay sober, and die sober, and that has become my experience. Um, you know, when I get asked to, to share and do things, uh, I want you all to understand something. Um, God separated me from alcohol October 19th of 1982 when I didn't know God. And that lasted for 10 years, and then I almost committed suicide behind untreated alcoholism. And <clears throat> once again, God showed up and prevented that. And from really from 1991 on, I have made this a way of life. But what I want you to know is this. Uh, I do not make this a way of life because I want people to like me. Uh, I did not make this a way of life because I thought one day I would get to come here and share that with you. I had to make it a way of life sober because nothing else worked. See, I know what it's like to just not drink and go to meetings. I know what it's like to work the steps one time and have sober time and be absolutely miserable and dying and not be able to tell anyone that. I know what it's like to be sober and still be irresponsible with money and in relationships. And I know what it's like to be sober and still be dishonest, etc., etc., etc. And what finally happened to me is... Uh, Behind that, almost committing suicide because I was having so much fun in sobriety. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I looked at the book uh, and I and I really saw I wasn't making a way of life. That there were there were a lot of things in that book that it was asking me to do every day that I wasn't willing to do, and I paid a dear price for that. And so I made a decision uh, in early, it really in late '91. I drew a line in the sand. And I said, I gave it my best shot drinking, and I gave it my best shot sober, and neither one of them worked too well. So for here's the deal. From now until I leave this planet, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it 24-7. I'm going to do it till I die. I'm going to do exactly what they said. And what I can tell you about that is uh, my life has never been the same. So um, the reason that I do what I do with the strict spiritual disciplines is outlined in the big book because I like the effect produced. Right. See, I drank because I liked the effect produced. I have been in AA and done middle of the road. Or uh, uh, most drunks were great sprinters, aren't we? In a hundred yard dash for ten, I'm going to give ten yards. I'm going to give you my best shot. You know. But and and so I, I had experience with that. And uh, and and you know, in a precise universe, you get what you put out. And when I really made a thorough uh, commitment to really do this thing, when I got out of the nut house, I reworked the first nine steps. Uh, four times in two years. I had a lot of unwritten inventory, which really means that there was a big part of me that loves to play God, that it was an absolute rage that life wasn't going the way I wanted. And some of you sitting in this room sober might be able to understand that. I was in a rage. Uh, how you doing, Mark? Oh, doing just fine, you. You know, I don't know how you guys drank, but let me tell you what. Uh, how, my, how important alcohol was to a guy like me. You know that not once in all my years of drinking did I ever think of committing suicide? I did a lot sober prior to 1991. See, because booze is my solution. Um, for a guy like me, there's only two things in my life that ever give me ease and comfort, allow me to be in this skin and interact with you with any sense of peace and dignity. That's either a tremendous amount of alcohol or a tremendous amount of God. That's my experience. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of God just doesn't do it for me. See, there was a lot of belief systems uh, from 1991 on. A lot of belief systems I'd picked up in the years over at AA had to go, and I came to find out that most of those belief systems were not in the Big Book. Uh, they were opinions uh, of other people. The reason I gravitate them to, quite frankly, because it's an easier, softer way. 
the, I like the idea, for example, of only writing one inventory and living in 10, 11, and 12. That's kind of neat, right? See? And I like the idea of the fact that, that uh, I probably can't make most of my amends because I can't find people. That's kind of neat, too. See? And I like the idea that I'm going to make living amends and, you know, and, uh, uh, but well, you know, and I like the idea that well, I know some people have hey, you have to meditate, but you know, you don't you don't have to. Marco wasn't really that bad, and and you know, I I mean, I liked all that stuff. I liked all those ideas because that's an easier, softer way, right? Listen, if spiritual living was easy, we'd have to rent Shea Stadium to do this. See, uh, that's another idea I had to get rid of. Uh, spiritual living, it's it's not easy. I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that. Because I I like to share initially when I get going with you where I'm at in my life. And I want to tell you how spiritually fit uh, Dave and I are. Um, We, (laughs) we, uh, we, we, when when we found out we were going to do this together, we made an agreement to write inventory and swap fifth steps. So a little over a month ago, he flew out to uh, Dallas. And uh, so in our arrogance, I think we both kind of figured this would probably take an hour, hour and a half. We'd go have a nice dinner. Well, nine and a half hours later. <laughs> we, we, so I, I, that's how spiritually fit I am at almost 19 years and him with almost 20, right? So uh, we, we're qualified to be up here. Can you, can, can, can you imagine what, what condition the world would be in if guys like him and I sober weren't continually doing this work? You know, uh, I'm as awake as most people that I know in, in between the two of us. We, and I mean this. We spent nine hours swapping a fifth step. And then I got resentful at him because he hopped a plane and left, and I had to go speak that night. <laughs> that was an interesting experience, to say the least. So, uh, you know, I'm just here to share all that with you. I, I, I want to speak to that part of you that doesn't want to learn anything new uh, that really kind of has its mind of its own within your mind. But... And what I want to tell that part of you is that nobody in this room has ever done anything wrong. And, and, and anything you've done at all, relative to staying sober, is fine and wonderful and, and beautiful. I'm just hoping that this weekend that uh, we can maybe get you excited about knowing God at a level that you know nothing about. Uh, uh, I submit to every one of you in here that there are dimensions of love and joy and wonder and friendship and service that you know nothing about. There, there are dimensions of fearlessness that you know nothing about, and, and I would hope that we could get you excited about taking a course of action to experience that. You know, I mean, I, I give you an example of what I mean. I know some of you, and uh, I was thinking to myself, of those of you here that I've come to know over the years, when I see you, my heart just swells with love. See? That wasn't possible to me even four years ago, right? And the rest of you that I don't know, I look at you and I look at you with love and compassion. And there's nothing between me and you. There's no wall. You know what I'm talking about? Hell, as little as five, six years ago in AA, if I would come to something like this, there was a shield, a wall between me and you. And I was so, you know, and I was afraid, see? But there are dimensions of experience and consciousness through these steps that that are beyond anything that you can imagine, see? I'm more excited today about AA, God, this process, than I've ever been in my life. And the reason is because there's no ends to it, see? God always takes me far beyond anything that I have ever experienced. And that is an incredibly exciting way to go through life. See, the most exciting thing in my life today is I don't have a clue what's going to happen during the course of the day, and that is an awesome thing. Now, there was a time I had to know exactly what was going to happen, and you follow me? That's completely different today. And I literally, at times, go whole days where I don't experience fear. See? And I have whole days where I can just relax and take it easy. See? Or I can ride in a car with someone like Dave who thinks he's a pilot in the automobile and, <laughs> and, and not have fear and not have my spinker muscle around my neck and, you know. You know, neat, neat, uh, neat stuff like that. So, uh, you know, that's what we're really here to talk about is a very, you know, we're so blessed in AA because our donkey is so crystal clear about how we can get there. It's not ambiguous at all, see? But it truly does start with the first step and this idea about being powerless and this idea about your life unmanageable. And uh, Dave brought up a, a few things, and I, I really believe in... Most of my sharing in my life is lived in the present moment because it's the only reality of my life. I mean, I, I want you to think about this a minute. 
How many of you during the course of the day thought a lot about the past? Okay, and how many of you in the course of the day thought a lot about the future? Okay. Well, here's the deal. The only reality, reality of our life is this present moment. And every past event was a present moment. And every future event will be a present moment. So the only reality of your life is the present moment. So how much of the day are you never present to the only reality in your life? <laughs> you understand what I just said? See, you're, it, drunk, it, drunks are always in a hurry to get somewhere, but they're never wherever they're at. See? Spiritual living is designed to get me present. To, to be awake, aware, mindful, and conscious, you see, of exactly where am I at. Uh, my deal no longer is where am I at and who am I with and what am I doing. My deal is am I present to where I'm at, to the holiness, to the sacredness, conscious contact right now. You see the shift in how you get to go through life? That comes from working with those strict disciplines of the 10th and 11th step. They are very strict spiritual disciplines. That comes with... You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a baby in meditation, but I've, I've had a daily meditation practice for 11 years. Uh, you know, and, and when I talk, I, I, I like to talk about what am I doing currently in my life to, to go through life like this, this position of neutrality, uh, to be in, in a, a state the book calls called recovered. You know, what are you doing, see, with that? Well, you know, I begin my day, most days, at 5 a.m., and I still work with an hour in prayer and meditation. My current meditation practice is two times a day for 24 minutes. Right now I happen to be listening to a theta metronome. Because over the years, my meditation practice, uh, it'll get dry or I'll get the chatter of a thousand monkeys going on. You all familiar with that one, right? going to sit down and do this holy act and this committee starts. And when that happens, I like to get a metronome because the brain syncs with the metronome whether I want to or not. At the same time, during the course of my day, from the time I leave my house till I come back into my house, I get to pick and practice all the 10th and 11th step tools. What are those tools, right? Tools like watch and ask and turn and... How about this one in traffic? I've ceased fighting anything or anybody. <laughs> okay. um, you know, position of neutrality. Pause when agitated or doubtful. Ask God for the right thought or action. Thy will not mine be done practices that you just work with all over and over and over again that are fascinating to take in to shift from one activity to another how can i best serve thee thy will not mine be done fun fun stuff to practice right and then in the evenings right now i'm finishing off my evenings normally with a written evening review and then i'm doing another 24 minute meditation uh, those are my current practices uh, big book says be quick to see where religious people are right uh, right now there are two other books that uh, I'm doing some practices with. One is The Four Agreements, which some of you may be very familiar with. Uh, and the other is a book called The Power Now by Eckhart Tolle. The other thing uh, about me, I do not read books for knowledge. This is a room full of men and women who are educated way past our intelligence. See? We do not need more knowledge. What I needed was a hell of a lot more experience, see? So when I read books today, which is what the 11th step is all about, right, is I'm looking for practices that I can bring into my life so that I can have an experience and then throw the book away. I'm not looking for any more knowledge. Uh, recently off this fifth step that I just uh, did with Dave, uh, it became very clear to me that I needed to give almost all my books away and, and work with three books for at least 12 months. And so that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm giving almost all my books away, and I'm going to work with three books for the next 12 months. And what I really needed to do was I don't need any more knowledge about anything. <laughs> what I need to do is really just get present to what is, to God, to conscious contact, to my fellow brother and sister, and get rid of all this knowledge and all this other neat, neat stuff and just live with that moment by moment by moment by moment wherever that takes me and however that looks see? so you know the, the book in the 10 step you've entered the world of the spirit and I'm, that's what I'm talking about see I'm very aware of the fact that I have an awakened spirit that I take into my human doing you see I take my being into my doing but I'm not my doing see this happens through a if you drink enough whiskey come to AA and work the steps this is the kind of neat stuff you get to experience see Stuff that if I'd have heard before, I would have been thinking you were doing a little too much LSD, right? <laughs> See? Then I come to find out, no, this is, this is the path. This is the path of spiritual living that our incredible book talks about in a very precise, specific, clear-cut way. 
Uh, I started about uh, probably three months ago. I spend some time on what I call the first three-step considerations. I review the first step. I take a look at the second step and my deal with the second step. Here's what it is. Is there more past here? Can God take me past here? Past my knowledge of all these experiences, past what I think I know. Is there more past here? Are there dimensions of consciousness I know nothing about? Am I willing to allow God to take me past here? See? I made that third step decision again. And like I said, Dave and I wrote the inventory and we swapped fifth steps. Uh, I read that inventory to uh, two other guys uh, who I work with. Uh, who both started laughing in the middle of that. And I said, what are you laughing at? And they said, we thought you'd be a lot weller than this. <laughs> and, 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 and I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad you see that I'm still very much a human being. Um, see, because you cannot defeat your ego. See, I don't care how long you're sober. Your ego is as mysterious and powerful as God himself as far as you're concerned, and you cannot defeat your ego. You cannot defeat your ego. It'll take the best of us, and it'll take you right out of here. Particularly, the longer you're sober, your ego still operates in the same fashion, but it's got a new face. See, you now got the spiritual mystic and the, you know, the sponsor of the month, and you got, you know, and but they're just new faces. They're a lot different than the ones we came in when it was like convict, liar, thief, right? <laughs> See? But it's the, it's still the same stuff, you know, the upholder of the traditions, you know, and uh, you know, guy gets in a bell tower and blows away the people in world service and they can't figure out why you know <laughs> he's 29 years sober how'd that happen you know so you know you 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 and i did i did step six and there's a tool i use for that i use the sacraments of penance big book talks about you want to face and be rid of the exact nature of your defects that's a tool that allows me to identify my defects at a level that i never saw before and if any of you have any form of spiritual pride, I'd be happy to give that to you or tell you how to get it, and it'll strip it from you very clear. Um, <laughs> then I do a seventh step, and I, out of that uh, uh, inventory, I had uh, eight amends to people and two to institutions, and I've made uh, six of those amends and one of those amends to an institution. And so now I'm, I'm almost right back up. But I've got to tell you what's going on with me now. You can't pour old wine in new skin, and every time back through the steps, belief systems I'm living my life on are stripped. Uh, a little later through the weekend, I was telling Dave, <laughs> I, boy, have I had some belief systems altered and changed, uh, which I'll share with you as, as we go through the weekend. But uh, So that's what I'm here to do. I'm, I'm here to make the strong yearn for more and make the weak run from nothing. I'm here to tell you that God loves you beyond anything that you can imagine. I'm here to tell you that we have an incredible way in which you can experience that. And then in which you can take that out of here and take that back into your homes and meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Take it into your employer. Take it everywhere you want. And that you can go through life with some sense of peace and power and dignity and, and direction. And uh, uh, develop a, a, a love of life in the present moment that is beyond anything that you can conceive of. So that's what we're here to chat with you this weekend about. Thanks, Mark. Um, I got sober on uh, December 5th, 1981, and uh, I was 19 years old. And uh, I just finished basically drinking my way out of my uh, second year in college. And my father had gotten sober when I was in high school. And uh, he, if I wanted to see my dad, I had to go to AA meetings. And it was one, up to that point that my favorite practice in the whole world was to get together with my father and really tie one on and go to an AA meeting. Because it was one of the few places I felt at home. So I knew that if, it was a, if I didn't die in, in, with my drinking, that eventually I'd end up in an AA meeting. And, uh, and so my whole drinking career from that point forward, I had this image in my mind of driving towards a cliff. And I was playing chicken with the cliff. And I was going to get as close to the edge of that cliff as I possibly could maybe even take a step up one foot over and then come back when I couldn't take it anymore then come running back to AA. And, uh, and I managed to basically to pull that off. Um, uh, I ended up in, uh, in a hospital and came out of a coma and the first phone call that I made was to my father. And I had not talked to him in years. And uh, I basically had stole a bunch of money from him and said, don't call me, I'll call you, have a nice life. And I learned about AA because he had flown 2,000 miles, gone to meetings, 
had phone numbers. So when I made that phone call, literally within hours, AA members were in my hospital room. And uh, I flew back to, to New Jersey and, and uh, had some surgery done. Uh, I, I got into a bunch of fights. I was an angry, violent alcoholic. Um, the problem was I couldn't tell when I was going to be an angry, violent alcoholic. One day I could be drinking with my best friends and we'd have a good time. And the next day I'd literally be putting my friends in the hospital. And uh, it's kind of hard to keep friends that way, you know what I mean? Um, but those bursts of anger were a problem for me. And I had to deal with that when I came into AA. So when I got here, I was hurting. I would have done anything they told me to do. And so I started to do what they told me to do. And I, I got a sponsor, and, and he started talking about reading the book. And, and I couldn't admit to the guy that I, I really couldn't read. You know, I was petrified if they would hand something that would come, like a 12 and 12 meeting where they pass the book around and everybody has to read. Because my ego wouldn't allow me to say, I pass. And God forbid I try to read something out loud because I couldn't read. I couldn't re make the words out. Um, I don't know how I got out of high school, you know, or even eighth grade, for God's sake. Um, but uh, I started down the path. And I'm one of those people that just by not putting alcohol in my body, the pain started to wear off. And so I started very quickly stopping to do what I knew I was supposed to do. I, I was graced with a guy that knew the big book. He told me what was in the big book. He showed me, he gave me a gift. And I said, yeah, that's great information, but I had a resentment against God. I didn't trust God, I didn't know what God was, and I was afraid of the unknown. I wasn't gonna have a, a, a God experience. And that can only take you so far in AA. And uh, my life started getting better. I started going back to college and uh, I started dating, you know, my life started to fill up, and so what's going to go, you know? Go to meetings and, and work steps or, or go to college and, and go out and chase women and have a good time. So you can imagine what went. And uh, I found myself uh, very much like Mark, um, also at 10 years sober. Uh, I crashed big time. And uh, it's funny, one of the reasons uh, I, I got to meet Mark because uh, I'd been hearing his tapes for years and... and uh, it hit me one day in meditation that I was to track him down. And so uh, working with various tapers, I, I called all the tapers and I called Glenn, I called, you know, called around and said, I need to get in touch with Mark Houston. Anybody who knows where he is, let me know. And uh, nothing came. And it was almost three years from the time I put that word out that I was trying to track him down. And I just kind of let it go. And then one day I got an email and it said, oh, he's back and here's his email. And I fired off an email to him and said, hey, you know, I'm this drunk from New Jersey. I'd like to get together with you. Where are you? And at that point, he had resurfaced in, in Austin, Texas. And uh, he sent me his phone number. So I called him up and said, hey, I want to come down and see you. I want to meet you. Uh, what's good for you? And, and uh, he, he said, well, I'm down in Austin. Come, come on down whenever you want. And I'm an airline pilot. And it just so happened the next day I had a trip. And my trip took me to Austin, Texas. No coincidences. Um, and down I went. The next day I was drinking coffee with Mark. And the two of us, you know, the more I get to know about the man, the more I see that we're connected. His sobriety date is my birthday. You know, I, it's hard for me to forget his sobriety date. There's, there's connections like that. He started talking to me and, and he's telling me a story about his family of origin and he mentions a name. And I said, well, is that your mother's side? And I think we're even related, you know, <laughs> way back when, you know. But... Uh, at 10 years sober, I had the exact same thing happen to me. I didn't check into a psycho ward, but uh, I'm also in the military. I fly planes for the military, and I was in the reserves, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm cleaning my 9 millimeter, and I'm military trained. I know how to deal with a gun. And you clear it, and then you clear it, and when you think it's clear, you clear it yet again. And I'm clearing it, and all of a sudden, I kind of pop out of reality, and I'm, and I'm excuse me, I wasn't clearing it, I was cleaning it. And it suddenly occurred to me that I'm sitting there, and I'm looking down the barrel of the gun, and I haven't cleared it, and there's a round in the chamber. It got my attention. I, of course, I immediately dismissed it and said, whoa, that was dangerous. Don't ever do that again. You know, God was trying to get my attention. You know, I didn't realize how close I was and how often I had thoughts of suicide at 10 years sober. You know, like Mark, I didn't think of committing suicide when I was drinking. I thought I was invincible. You know, I went off a motorcycle at 75 miles an hour, went under a semi, and I walked away to tell the story. I mean, I have all kinds of drama like that in my life. I literally thought I was invincible when I was drinking and drugging. I never thought I would off myself, you know. Um, I commit, really quickly dismissed that. And uh, about a week later, I'm flying uh, over the Alps with a guy. And 
he makes a mistake and we almost flew into the side of the Alps with 400 people on board. Let me tell you, that will get your attention. God had my attention. And here I am carrying this baggage and what do I do? I don't believe in God. I gave God up in AA, sober. I walked away and I was living a lie in the rooms of AA. I had double digit sobriety. I can't admit what tremendous spiritual pain I'm in, you know? And now my career's at risk. And everybody's telling me to lie. And the one thing I learned in AA was you don't lie. You tell the truth and you take the shots. And I managed to get through that when the dust was settled. Everybody else had lied and they fired everybody else. And I hadn't done anything. But in my alcoholic head, I had done what was right. And I had tried to do what was right at the time. And I walked away. And I started taking credit for it. Oh, look how good I am. I told the truth. Well, let me tell you, God has got a sense of humor. Because literally less than a week later, I'm activated for the Gulf War, you know, and I'm over in the sandbox for a year, flying in and out. And I had a, a spiritual awakening, flying into an area, and the intelligence we had was that the, the base we were going to was under chemical attack. I had to make a decision, do I trust God or don't I? It's the first time in my life, I always carry literature. I pulled the big book out in the cockpit. I opened up the big book, took the third step prayer. I offered my life to God as I understood my life. I said, God, if today's the day that I die, today's the day I die. I've had it. I can't take this anymore. And naturally, I did what I had to do. I put my cam gear on. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> you know? and, it, and it turns out, our side says there was no chemicals. The British say there was chemicals. I mean, a lot of people say there was chemicals where I went. I didn't, thank God, knock on wood, don't have any effects of that. But what it did was, it was once again God getting my attention. How thick do I have to be? So I came back into the rooms and I had to redo my entire life in sobriety. I had to admit that I had been lying to each and every one of you. I had been taking guys through the 12 and 12. I knew it was in the big book. It was much easier for me to take guys through the 12 and 12 because I didn't have to face what I wasn't doing. I could just talk about it in theory and, and, and you know, boom, 30 minutes. I mean, we were, pff, go write your inventory. And I couldn't figure out why guys weren't getting it, you know. Um, I had to go back and make amends for that. First, I had to go do another inventory. I had to write all this stuff down. It was a huge inventory, let me tell you. There was lots and lots of resentments underneath there. And I had to start down the process. I had to start doing regular inventories. I had to go back and make amends to each one of those guys and take them through the work. And as I'm taking them through the work, they're going, wow, I've never seen anything like this. And they're having experiences. And then a couple of them got together and said, hey, Dave, why don't you do a little workshop? I'm like, I don't want to do that. And next thing you know, I'm doing a workshop and then another workshop and then another workshop. And the next thing you know, I'm, here I am in Fellowship of the Spirit. And that's how I, I did not want to do this. You know, Mark always, I hear Mark always saying that. The only people that get up here that want to do this are people that have never been up here doing this. It's a bear. I could never have cried in front of however many number of people here before. When I was 10 years sober, I'd have rather killed myself than to show you who and what I am. But today, I can look out there and I can look at the sparkling eyes, the windows to the soul, and I can see the love shining back. That's the whole purpose this weekend for me, is to have a connection with you folks. Um, I started writing inventory. I've, I have changed my life. I got back in to, to my marriage. I started working the traditions in my marriage. I started working the concepts in my marriage. I started working all three sides of the triangle. I started doing the deal. And I made a covenant with a friend of mine. And I said, you and I, we're the only two thumpers around pretty much that we see each other regular at meetings. Let's leave the old timers alone and let's grab every newcomer and create what we crave. And we started down that path. And we started doing that. You know, and in very short order, there started to be little clusters of, of meetings that started to grow from that. And it wasn't dark tunnel AA anymore in the area that I was, you know. And, and then I went through a period where I became uh, an evangelist like Mark talked about. And I became one of the most hated guys in North Jersey, you know, because I was beaten on the book because it was such a passionate thing for me. And I've seen that that's, I now have to tone that down because they're doing the best they can with what they got. And if I carry the right message, they'll want what I have. I don't have to go beat them and whack on them, you know, to, to, to do that, you know. And thank God there were people in, in North Jersey that were doing like Howard, you know, that were still carrying the big message, so I knew it was there. We hadn't lost it completely, you know. And now I made, I've made a commitment to AA. 
to carry and do this deal to the best of my ability. My life is an open book. My marriage is an open book. You will see in the guide, my sex ideal is in the book, in that little package that I handed out. It's not my current one. It was one from a couple of inventories. But I have so many people saying, I got the idea, concept of kind of what a sex ideal is. What is it? So finally I said, well, just put mine in there so they can see what mine looks like and kind of give them an idea of what it's supposed to be. You know, um, Like Mark talked about, I get up, whatever time I have to get up, I get up almost two hours early. Uh, an hour buffer because I, you know, I, if, if I wake my kids up, I take the kids so my wife can get some sleep because I'm, I'm trying not to be selfish. And by the way, I, I want to publicly thank my wife and kids. I would not be here today at this fellowship if I had not gotten their permission. If they didn't say, okay, Dad, we're willing to give you up for the weekend. You know? So it's a sacrifice on my family's part. That's how much my family believes in this, in this program. We work the steps. We work the concepts. We work the, we'll talk about that more in my family. I'll talk about how to bring this stuff home and change the lives of the people that you're at home with, the people that you care about but you can't share with. You know? um, so I do that stuff. I get up in the morning and I start out with prayer and meditation. I'm, I'm running about an hour uh, in prayer and meditation. Uh, on page 16 of the guide, there's something in there that a lot of you probably have never seen. There's the lost chapters in the big book nobody ever wants to talk about. Two wives, family afterwards, and a vision for you. you know, I didn't put in two employers because really two employers is how to do a 12-step call. But on page 16, I condense down those visions and I, there's the principles, the spiritual principles we're supposed to be working on our family. If you guys want to change your lives, I just challenge each and every one of you. Pray the stuff that's on 16. Every bold letter on page 16, take that in your prayer and meditation to, tomorrow morning and on Sunday morning and see what that does for your home life. See how that changes your home life. Practice in these principles. Because somebody one day, I was, I don't know, 17 years sober, and somebody finally said, Hey, Dave, what are these principles that we're supposed to be practicing in all our affairs? And nobody had ever asked me that question. And I didn't know at the time. And I started, I gave him an answer, of course. I'm an alcoholic. You know, I had an answer. <laughs> but it got me thinking. And I had to think, what are the principles that I have to practice? Well, that's a whole sheet of principles coming from straight from our big book. You'll notice at the bottom there's some things that aren't numbered. They're on bullets. Because I believe that's what good for the, the goose is good for the gander. Bill Wilson wrote those talking to the spouse. So in brackets, I put the word that I wanted to convey, the meaning, making it universal. Instead of saying, you shouldn't you know, do something to him or her, I changed it that we shouldn't. You know? and, and so you can tell what's my writing, what comes straight from the big book. And the page numbers are there, so you can go back and take a look at this stuff. Um, I always start with the basics of what's in the big book, and then I go on from there. And the more my sobriety goes on, the more I add. I, too, have been working with a number of books. I've been working with Tolle. I've been working with uh, The Four Agreements. Um, I, Lao Tzu, The Way of Life, I just finished on my vacation down at the beach. What a wonderful vacation sitting there reading that. Um, I've been doing some work with Zen. Uh, a lot of work about being current and present. And we'll be talking about that, especially when we start talking about inventory. At least I'll be talking about that stuff. Um, I realized here I am almost 20 years sober in AA and if you ask me what the 12 steps are, I can quote the 12 steps verbatim. If you ask me what the 12 traditions were, I couldn't tell you what the 12 traditions were. I knew tradition 3, I knew tradition 7, but the rest, you know, if I have to read them, I can read them, but I couldn't quote them off the top of my head, much less the concepts. So what I do now in my Steel on Steel group, I got challenged one day. They said, is it possible that maybe you need to start reading those on a daily basis? So I read the 12 traditions and the 12 concepts every morning as part of my meditation to get to know that. And I realized how much that's changed my family life. It's changed the way I work AA. It's changed the way I work with my sponsees. Yeah, I know the 12 concepts are for world service, but you know what? Bill Wilson wrote an article that says that trickles down. It's for every area of service. Well, if I'm working the 12th step, I'm part of the service structure, which means those 12 concepts apply to me. You know, six warranties. If you had asked me five, maybe well, probably longer, 10 years ago what the, what the six warranties were, I couldn't have told you. I knew that they were something to do with service work because I had gotten into service work early on in sobriety because I wanted to have that ego shot. Well, I'm a, I'm a DCM. Well, I'm a, you know, and that kind of deal. I really wanted to have a position. I wanted to have a title, you know. But now I know the six warranties, and I apply those. I apply the concepts. My little kids apply the concepts, and we'll talk about that this weekend. At least I will. Um, I believe fervently of what's in this program. I read from the Bible the way Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson did. Uh, I, 
I read The Upper Room, which is one of the early publications. It's still in print. You can get it. I read The Daily Bread. Uh, there's certain things that I read every day that are, are reg a regular regime, and then there's other stuff that I get off into. Um, a friend of mine who's here tonight, I haven't had a chance to talk to her, right before I came, to the, the, the mail came, right before I left my house, and I open up the mail, and inside is a, is a meditation book. You know, and I will be picking that up and taking it. I take what's given to me, and various people give me gifts, and they say, "Hey, have you ever thought of doing this?" And I'm awake today, and I say, "You know what? That was God speaking to me. Maybe I should go read that, or listen to this, or get the tapes, or or do something with that." I don't just say, "Well, maybe someday," you know, I'll get around to that stuff. Uh, I work very hard at this this weekend. Um, my goal is going to be to share with you how to connect each of the 12 steps back to 10 and 11 to that prayer and meditation. I may be flying it at, at 4 o'clock in the morning. If God is the most important thing in my life, if I'm going to be getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, guess what? I'm getting up at midnight to do my prayer and meditation before I go to work because that's the start of my day. You know, I believe in this deal. The other day, I was... Well, it wasn't the other day. It was back in June. I was, I was in London... And I'm thinking, you know, it's just about the time, my normal bedtime, and I was starting to get up. And I got up and I did prayer and meditation. And my body did not want to get up. But I had one of the most profound experiences I've had over there. And it was right before I went and read Fifth Step with, uh, with Mark. Um, this, since I did that Fifth Step with Mark, uh, I did the Sacrament of Penance also. And, and I'm writing an inventory based on the Sacrament of Penance. <clears throat> But in working with the sacrament of penance, my meditation life changed. I also, for about a week, could not get the chatter of a thousand monkeys out of my head. So I had to use a crutch to help me get into that quiet time. And now I'm experiencing stuff. I shared with Mark, we were downstairs meditating and get ready to come up here and, and do this talk. I'm experiencing stuff in meditation that is blowing my mind. I, it scares me because I have no idea what it is. But you know what? It doesn't matter what it is, it's an experience. And it's love and it's coming from God. That's all I care about. Let's see where it takes me. Let's ride that donkey. And when it's time to shift to another donkey, I'll shift to the next donkey. You know? uh, there's an Al Anon um, story about donkeys. Do I have time? Yeah, okay. I'll share this story and then I'll shut up. <clears throat> uh, I love Mark's do donkey story about riding up the mountain. And then somebody, when they heard me talking about the donkey parable and they, they, uh, they sent me an Al Anon donkey parable. And it's. Uh, this old man and his son, and, and they have this donkey, and they load the donkey with, the, with all their burdens, and, and then they hop on the donkey themselves. So the donkey's loaded with all these packages, and this old man and his kid, and they, they're starting to ride into town. And as they're riding into town, as they pass people on the road, everybody starts commenting, you know, look at these guys, look what they're doing to that poor donkey, you know. And so the old man starts feeling guilty, and he says, okay, so he hops off the donkey. So he's walking along the side of the donkey that's loaded down with the little kid on it, you know, and then they run past some more people, and some more people say, hey, look at that, I can't believe. The, look at that donkey, it's still overloaded. So he talks to the little kid and says, come on, we'll walk, we'll give the donkey a break. You know? and, and they run into some more people. And the next thing you know, they take the packages off the donkey. You know? And more people are complaining. So they put all the packages back on the donkey and then they decide to carry the donkey. Right? So they're walking down the road and they're carrying the donkey and they're walking across this footbridge you know, over the river and they slip and they, they drop the donkey off. The donkey goes right in the water. What's the moral of the story? If you allow other people in your mind and to control you and to tell you, you're going to lose your ass. You know? Right? My wife is a black belt Al Anon. When I shared that with her, she didn't find it as funny as you guys did. <laughs> you know? She's been going to Al Anon for almost 15 years. You know? The program has changed my home life. I can't separate it. It is what I am. It's part of me. It's the same way that God is part of me and God is part of you. And like Mark said, I don't care what you've done. The lying, the cheating, the whoring, all that stuff that's in your past, the stuff that you still to this day have never shared in an inventory, the, the, the take it to the grave stuff, no matter what you did, all that is is a smudge on the mirror that I started to talk about. And I'm going to be talking about the golf ball. When we come into AA, we're a golf ball. We got that hard, crusty exterior. And our first inventory, we peel that hard, crusty exterior of the golf ball off. And then what's left? There's that crazy winding of all the... It looks like a giant rubber band. It's just really tight and it's sticky. And there's all those flex... I don't know what they are, but there's all this stuff stuck in that rubber band. And when you start to unwind that, as you get further and further down to the inside, it gets easier and easier to unwind it. Why? I don't know. Same way with our inventory. 
when you, if you've ever unraveled a golf ball, when you get to the very center, there's a kernel in the very center of a golf ball. I imagine that I am the golf ball. The kernel that's in the center of me is love. And if I can get rid of all the crazy windings and the hard shell of the exterior, I can get down to that. And the same thing resides in you. And my goal here is to look inside your golf ball and I want to see that kernel of love and feel it reflected back at me. And I will reflect back to you. And there's a, there's a you know, uh, who is it? I guess it's Tole that talks about two logs. If you take one log that's burning really brightly and you put another log up alongside of it, in just a little while, the two logs, the fire gets even brighter. The, they exchange the heat back and forth and the flame gets hotter. That's what this weekend's gonna be. And even when you pull the logs apart, the flame really stays bright for a while. And then the flame slowly starts to diminish. Well, what happens with us? Our ego starts to rebuild. Uh, Harry Tebow, anybody heard of Harry Tebow? One of the great founders of AA. For those of you who never heard of him, he was a psychiatrist. He was the medical director of Blywood Sanitarium. He talks about the reconstruction of the ego. That's what was going on with me when I had 10 years sober. My ego had fully rebuilt itself. This inventory that Mark and I did, you'll be hearing more about, I thought I work in the 12-step program. I thought I knew what was going on. What really happened, the reason it took nine and a half hours was my ego had reconstructed itself in a, in a blind spot and I just didn't see it. But uh, let me read a quote from Harry Tebow before, right before we go. I got, okay, I got time. It comes from Alcoholics Anonymous Comes of Age, one of our history books that nobody ever bothers to read. Page 311, first paragraph. It says, the characteristic of the so-called typical alcoholic is a narcissistic, egocentric core dominated by feelings of omnipotence, intent on maintaining at all costs its inner integrity. While these characteristics are found in other maladjustments, they appear in relatively pure culture in alcoholic after alcoholic. <laughs> Defiant individuality and grandiosity. In my opinion, those words were accurately chosen. Inwardly, the alcoholic brooks no control from man or God. He, the alcoholic, is and must be master of his destiny. He will fight to the end to preserve that position. I believe that any group or individual who fails to participate in the enterprises of the organization is rendering himself and his group a disservice by not submitting to the disciplinary values inherent in those activities. He may be keeping himself free of entanglements, but he is also keeping the ego unstopped. His chances of remaining sober are not of a high order. He is really going it alone and may be uh, needing another miracle which may not come off the next time. If you're one of those people that are looking for the next miracle, I hope that we are the next miracle this weekend. Open your minds. That's it. You can't, haven't figured it out. That's a big theme. The big book pounds it in. I don't know how many times it says, lay aside your prejudice, your preconceived ideas, and listen for God to speak through you. Let me be a mirror for you, and please, 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 you be a mirror for me this weekend. You know, and together our logs can burn really bright and we will have a wonderful God-centered experience with love. Thanks.